okay my screen is visible right yes it is visible okay great okay so the course that i am a ta or teaching assistant of is calculus of one real variable the instructor of this course is Professor Jaydeep Jatta of IIT Kanpur and I am Devushit and today we will solve the assignment of week 1 of the previous round of the course and so I will try to make these sessions as interactive as possible so I may ask uh, to someone to suggest if anyone have any idea how to solve some problems but I will mostly solve all the problems by myself also and after each problem is solved, I will wait a few moments to see if someone has any questions. Okay, so let us begin. So the first problem of today is where whether root 2 plus 1 by root 2 is a rational number or irrational number. So let us first see whether root 2 is rational, rational or irrational. So anyone from the audience will like to answer that? Root 2 is irrational. Yeah, you are correct. Root 2 is a irrational number. Then using this information, we can actually see whether root 2 plus 1 over root 2 is irrational or not. So we can write it as just simplify this and we will get 3 over root 2 or we can again write it as root 3, sorry 3 by 2 times root 2. Now, the term within the parenthesis, this 3 by 2 term, this can be written as p over q, where both p and q are integers and it is clear that q is not equal to 0. So, this 3 by 2 that we have here in the parenthesis is rational. And we have already established that root 2 is irrational number. So, what will be the product of a rational and a irrational number? It will be irrational and we can simply prove it by contradiction. So, let us assume that the number which is given in the question is rational. Okay. So, from the definition of rational numbers, we know that we can write it as p over q, where both p q belongs to the set of integers and q is not equal to 0. Now, Now we can simplify this as
like this. Now here we can see that we have written root 2 in terms of q and p and here the denominator and numerator both are integers because p and q are integers right so if this is correct then root 2 should be rational but this is a wrong result which implies that our uh, our first assumption that 3 by 2 times root 2 is a rational number is also wrong So, the correct answer will be that this is not a rational number. Okay. So, this was the first problem. So, anyone has any doubt here? So, you can do it by square, I mean, like that uh, 3 by root 2 equals to p by q, then squaring in both side then uh, uh, I mean it has a uh, common factor 1 then after this we will prove that it has a common factor 2 then it's a contradiction like that you can do uh, yeah, yeah yeah what you are suggesting is also correct you can do that also and your mic is also not clearly audible oh sorry uh, what I was saying is that uh, what you are suggesting is also correct you can do that but uh, uh, and uh, your mic is uh, not very clear so you can also write the questions in the chat box I will be monitoring the chat box also okay so can I go to the next problem then okay Uh, so, the second problem is here and here we have to find limit of this function. Now, if you look at the numerator and denominator here, and put the value x equal to 1, you will see that both the top and the bottom part are actually becoming 0. So, we cannot find the limit in this form and so the common way to solve this kind of situation is to check whether there are any common factors which can be cancelled out in the de denominator and numerator. So, to do that, let us look at the denominator which is minus 3. Okay. So, we can write it as which just becomes Now, if we compare this with the term on top, we will see that there are apparently it seems that there are no terms which can be cancelled out, but let us do one more step and write x minus 1 as root x minus 1 times root x plus 1. This can be done because we can use the formula a square minus b square is a plus b times a minus b 
and now we can see that root x minus 1 term this term can be cancelled out on top and the bottom and with this we can rewrite the expression like this. This was root x plus 1, root x minus 1, 2x plus 3 and these terms will get cancelled out and now none of the denominator and numerator are going to 0. So, we can just put x equal to 1 and we will obtain the limit as So, limit of x tends to 1 this function is actually minus 1 by 10. So, this is the correct answer. Okay, so we are done with the second problem. So, anyone has any doubt here? Okay, it seems everyone has understood. So, let me go to the next problem. Okay. So, here also we have to find limit and here x is a real number and as x is going to minus 1, we have to find the limit of the expression x square minus 1 divided by mod x minus 1. So, let us first see what this mod x is. This is defined as x if x is greater than 0 and it is defined as minus x if x is less than 0. And okay, so we have to evaluate the limit at minus 1. So, in the vicinity of that point mod x can be written as minus x. So, this will be clear if I draw the function. So, this is mod x, this is x and we have to find the limit around this region. So, here mod x can be written as minus x. So, let us rewrite the expression. Again, this can be simplified. The top part we can write x plus 1 times x minus 1 we can take a negative sign common and this will be 1 plus x and on top and bottom this x plus 1 will get cancelled out and we will be left with limit x minus 1 x tends to minus 1 minus of x minus 1.
Oh, sorry, my network got, got disconnected. I hope you can see my screen now. Okay, so as I was doing this problem, limit in this expression can be simplified in this form and here the limit will be 2. Okay, so let us check the given options. So the first option is correct answer. Okay. So, so anyone has any doubts here? Okay, I have uh, also seen that some people are joining in between. So for them, I, I just want to know that this the recording of this lecture will be also uh, made available to you. And I will also be personally uploading them in my YouTube channel. So you can watch them at any moment. But it will be obviously beneficial to you if you are present during the live class. Okay, so if everyone is okay with this problem let us go to the problem number four again this is another problem of finding limit here theta tends to zero the function is cos theta minus one by theta square again we will find that when you put the value theta equal to zero cos theta minus one is one minus one zero and theta square is also 0. So the denominator and numerator both are going to 0. So we cannot evaluate the limit in this form and to get the answer we can use the formula of cos theta when theta is very small and this is given by 1 minus theta square by 2 factorial plus theta to the power 4 by 4 factorial and so on okay so i hope you guys know what factorial is 2 factorial is 2 times 1 c factorial is 3 times 2 times 1 so basically n factorial will be n times n minus 1 n minus 2 until it goes to 1 and when theta is small, we can approximate cos theta using this expression. So, let us rewrite the function here. We have limit theta tends to 0 cos theta minus 1 by theta square and this will be limit theta tends to 0 1 minus theta square by 2 factorial so here 2 factorial will be 2 this will be 6 and so on plus theta to the power 4 by 4 factorial minus theta to the power 6 by 6 factorial so on and there is a minus 1 term and whole thing divided by theta square now we can see that the ones will get cancel out and we can write this as limit theta tends to 0 minus 1 by 2 factorial plus theta square by 4 factorial minus 
theta to the power 4 by 6 factorial and so on. So what I have done is I have cancelled out theta square on both the numerator and denominator. Okay. So now if we put theta equal to 0, we will get that the value is minus half plus bunch of zeros because theta is 0, these terms will go to 0. So the limit of the given expression at theta tends to 0 is nothing but minus half. So let me put a box around this answer. And let us visit the given options. So here minus half is the correct answer. Okay. So that was our problem number four. And um, anyone has any doubts here? You guys can uh, hear my audio and see my screen, right? Okay, thanks. Okay, since there is no doubts, we can go to the next problem, which is problem number five. So here we have given a function. f which is defined in the real in the set of real numbers where 0 is not present and the function is given by fx equal to e to the power ln x square. Now what you have to find is the range of f. Okay, so let us first see what ln is. ln is nothing but natural logarithm where the base is e. So we can write ln x as log x base e. So the function e to the power ln x can be written as e to the power log e sorry this was x square and x square so here x belongs to the set of real numbers but x is not equal to 0 so first let us see what will be the range of x square This will again be real number, but let us call it y. y belongs to the set of real number such that y is greater than 0. This cannot be 0 because the domain here does not include 0. Okay. So, The range of x square will be zero to infinity. Similarly, what will be the range of ln x square? This is going to be minus infinity to infinity. And if we follow along this logic, we will find that the range of e to the power ln x square is again 0 to infinity because when limit when x tends to minus infinity e to the power 
x is actually 0. So, as x is not going to minus infinity here, the range will not contain 0. So, here it is a open interval and x tends to infinity to the power infinity will be tending to infinity ok. So, the answer to the question range of e to the power ln x square is zero to infinity and the options given here and none of them are correct. So, this was a typo probably. So, no options given here are correct. The correct answer will be this open interval 0 to infinity. Okay. So, that was problem number 5. So, does anyone have any questions? Okay, great. Let us go to the next problem then. So, this problem is asking us to consider a set x which is 0 to infinity, which is a subset of the real numbers, and then we have to find and comment on whether the complement of x is countable or not. So, does anyone in the audience like to answer that? Okay, I will share the problem here. So, x is defined like this, r is this and then the complement of x is countable or not. Okay, let, let us first answer where whether x are they are countable or not. So, does anyone know the answer? not countable. Okay. Yeah, you are correct. These are not countable. Okay. So, what will be the complement of x? So, will be defined as minus infinity to 0. x does not include 0. So, it will be a close interval here and complement of x will actually contain 0. So, since x and r they are not countable. So, this complement of x is also not countable. You can think of it uh, in this manner you have one set where the, where you cannot count the number of elements and you from that set you are taking out another set which is non-countable 
So what remains will also be non-countable. So that was problem number six. Uh, everybody is clear on that part, right? In, in this problem. Um, if someone has any doubts, please um, use the chat box or yeah, or you can unmute yourself and ask any questions. Okay, great. It seems everybody has understood everything. So, let us click the correct option here and move. To the next problem which is problem number seven okay so here there is a statement given which states that square root of a rational number is always an irrational number okay so what is an rational number we have already solved problem like this so a rational number is some number which can be written as p over q where p and q both belong to the set of integers and q is not equal to 0. So the square root of a rational number is written like this. And the question is whether this is always an irrational number. So this kind of uh, problem was actually given in the last assignment also, which was the prerequisite week zero assignment. So here I will tell you the answer that this is wrong yeah, and this will not always be a irrational number and we can give some counter examples. So, will anyone like to give any examples where the square root of a rational number is also rational? Anyone? Okay. Okay, Ashray Tiwari has a question. Okay, uh, let me solve this problem, then I will get to that. Since no one is answering, I will give the example here. So, let us consider the number 4, which can be written as 4 over 1. 4, 1, 4 and 1 both are integers so this is a rational number but the square root of 4 is actually 2 which is also rational so any number where the square root is can be found for example root over 9 is 3 this will provide as counter examples of the statements. So, the statement that square root of a rational number is always an irrational number is actually false.
okay so there was one question uh, which is basically asking that x is countable then mm -hmm. then complement of x will be countable no actually i think it is referring to the previous problem which is here so this set is not countable because there is no bijection from natural numbers to this set right you can have any number of numbers uh, between 0 and 1 any number of numbers between 1 and 2 so there will be no bijection from the set of natural numbers to this set so x is actually non countable we, we cannot count it so similarly by this by that logic also uh, the set of real numbers is also non countable so i think i have answered your question ashray if if your question is answered then you can write in the chat box then we'll proceed to the next problem um do you have any okay so you were asking for the complement okay So let me do it with an easy example. So let us consider a set A where the elements are 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. And let us consider another set B, which is defined as 0, 1, and 2. So what will be the complement? of b if x is taken as if a is taken as the universal set it will be the elements which are present in a but not present in b so this will be 3 4 and 5 i hope this definition is clear to you and in similar way for the problem that was given here, here the complement of x was taken by considering the set of real number as the universal set. Uh, we can also see it from a diagram. So let us consider this as a and the whole thing as the universal set then the complement will be actually the elements which are present in the universal set but are not present in a so that's how you define a complement ah is it okay now ashra Okay, fine. Then we can proceed to the next problem. And uh, thanks also, Ashray, because you are asking questions. So when someone asks uh, any question, then the session will be much more interesting. And otherwise, I will just be solving problems. So that is not very much. Uh, that is very straightforward and not interesting. Okay, so I will also encourage everyone who is having any doubt to ask questions okay aman has asked a question that how do we find complement of non countable number non countable number is actually a wrong notion you you can say that non countable sets then the definition will be like this where we have to take something as universal set okay 
So, suppose A is a, in another example, A is a non-countable set. Then, if you look at this diagram again, the complement will again be the elements which are well defined, but they are non-countable. We cannot count them, you cannot find a bijection from natural numbers to that set. So, but the elements of the sets in A are well defined. For example, here in the case of X also, the elements are well defined. So, for this case also, the complement will be the elements which are present in the universal set, but not present in A. And this example will also uh, work as a work as an example of how to find the complement of a countable set. Okay, I think I have answered uh, Aman's question. Okay, so Shakshi is asking how do we find range and domain of anything. Okay, so this kind of general questions I can take after I have gone through all the assignments. So, please hold them for now. So, there are three or four more problems left. So, when I am finished with them, I will take these questions. And for now, please let me know if you have any doubts from the problems. Ashra has also written, are we constrained to use complement property only for set? Not actually, but in this uh, lecture, in this session, we are interested in those. Okay, so I think I will move to the next problem, which is problem number 8. Okay, so here it is given that x and y are two rational numbers. So, it means we can write x as p over q, let us write it as p subscript x, q subscript x to just better identify them and y equal to p y over q y where p x P y q x q y are integers and q x q y are not equal to 0. Now, we are given four options. Okay, quickly, let me quickly check if I have marked the answers here. Yeah. Excuse me. Okay, so now we are given four options and we have to find which one is correct. So, the first option is x over y is always irrational. So, always irrational. So, you can quickly see that this is an uh, incorrect statement because uh, and a, a good example will be x equal to 4 and y equal to 2, then x over y will be 2, which is rational. Q, the set of rational number. Okay, so this statement here is incorrect. The second statement is x to the power 1 over y is always rational. So, this is incorrect.
and the second option is also incorrect because you can see from the previous problem where we established that the square root of a rational number can be rational or irrational. So, we can continue from there and fix y equal to 2 then x to the power 1 over y will be actually root x and root x can be irrational or rational. For example, when x equal to 4 then it will be rational, when x equal to 2 then root 2 it will be irrational. So, the statement that it is always rational is wrong. Okay. So, let us quickly see the last option here, then we will go to the third option. So, the last option is saying that x plus y may be irrational. So, let us check it. We can write x plus y as px over qx plus py over qy and we can simplify this as qx qy px qy py qx. As you know that px py qx qy all are integers then the top part here will also be an integer. And with similar logic this will also be belonging to the set of integers and since qx qy are not equal to 0 individually then qx times qy will also be not equal to 0. So, we can see that x plus y is a rational number always. That means the statement that it can sometimes be irrational is again wrong. So, this is also incorrect. So, we are left with the last option and uh, the third option x times y is always rational. So, let me get a new page. And let us see whether this is correct or not. So, this will be px qx times py or qy. And we can see here that again we can use the same logic where we what we used with the last option px, py, qx, py all belong to z, then this number will be a rational number. Okay. So x y will be always rational. So, the third option here is actually correct. So, 
so this is the correct answer okay so we are done with problem number eight and next is problem number nine but before that if anyone have any doubt on problem eight then please let me know okay devi kishore has no doubt anyone else okay so we'll move to problem number nine here two functions are given f and g they are mapped from r to r that means the domain of f and g both are r sorry that will be domain of f similarly here it will be actually a subset of r okay so let me quickly write the functions here fx is 2 and gx is x square minus 1 so i think okay divya, divya has one question so i will quickly answer that and also shakshi earlier asked uh, how do how to find range and domain of anything so shakshi please follow how i solve this question then i think your doubts will be cleared okay as for the best question that 2 plus 1 over 2 is irrational that is actually not correct so let us quickly see that 2 plus 1 over 2 this is nothing but two times two plus one over two, which is five by two. Now let us recall the definition of rational numbers. Numbers which can be written in the form of P over Q where p, q belong to the set of integers. p and q are integers and q is not equal to 0. Now, let us look at the number that Divya has given here. p is 5 and q is 2. So both 5 and 2 are integers and q is not equal to 2, sorry not equal to 0. Then 5 by 2 according to this definition is a rational number. I hope uh, your doubt is clear now Divya. If uh, it is clear then you can just say it in the chat box and I will move to the next problem. Ashra is asking about inverse function. I think that will be the topic of another lecture, not today's session. Okay, Divya, uh, it's all right. Um, I think you got confused with the first problem where it was given root 2 plus 1 over root 2. Okay, so let us go to the problem number 9, which was the domain and range of this function. So how do we define the domain of a function? 
the domain is basically a set where this function is defined. For example, if we take a function sin x, then we have to see what values x can take. x can take any value between minus and plus infinity, then sin will be defined. So, here the domain of f or to better say domain of sin x is nothing but the set of real numbers. But so the domain is actually considering for what values of x or the input of the function. the function is defined ok. So, similarly what will be the range of this same sine function range actually tells us what values the function can take and we all know that sin x has a value between minus and plus 1. So, this range of sin x will be minus 1 to plus 1. So, this takes into account the values the function can attain. So, let me give you another simple example. Which is log of x. Then what will be the domain? domain of log of x will be any number which is in between 0 to infinity. Why? Because we know that log of any negative number is not defined. So, the domain is actually uh, obtained by considering for what values of x the function is defined. If the function is not defined for some values of x, then the domain will not contain those values. Again, we can give another example of a function, suppose g x, which is mapped from set of real numbers to real numbers, but the function is given by root of x square minus 1. And you will see that when x or mod x is less than 1, then this square root is not defined. It will actually give you a complex number, which is not part of this real numbers that we are considering. So, here the domain of this function g will be everything in real number, but not. So, we can write it like this. Domain of g is y. such that y belongs to R, but and y is always mod of y is greater than equal to 1. So, that is how we define the domain and range of functions.
so domain takes into account for what values of the input the function is defined and range takes into account what values the function can attain given the domain okay so i think i have answered the question that uh, Mm, question that Shakshi asked I think um, it is answered and I will return to the problem of that is given here so okay so the function fx that the domain of f is r and the range of f this is a constant function so it will always be 2 gx domain is r range is x square minus 1 x square will always be positive so this will be like this so now we have to find what is the domain of the composite function or domain of f of g of x. So, what will be this function? This will be f of x square minus 1 and this will be equal to 2. So, since this is a function, our final function is a constant function, then the range of this FOG will actually be 2. And domain will be the domain of G which is the set of real numbers. So, if we go and look at the given on options here, we see that this is the correct one. Okay. So, I think this problem is answered and there is one question Ashray has asked which is uh, why have I written mod x uh, less than 1 can also write x less than 1 for which um, will be imaginary yeah actually, actually you, you are right then the fun the value of this gx function i think you are referring to this thing this uh, example function here then it will be imaginary but i have said that the function is mapped from the set of real numbers to real numbers but and the imaginary numbers are not a part of the real numbers right so So, when the function is defined like this, so this is the whole definition, then the domain will not contain these things, this range of numbers. I think I have answered uh, the questions of Ashray and Saksi. So, if you guys are okay, then I will move to the next problem, which is the last problem of today. I think uh, we can move to the next last problem then.
okay so again this is a problem where you have to find the limit but the function here is given as 1 minus x if x is less than 1 and x if if x is greater than equal to 1 then we have to find the limit of x tends to 1 fx now we know that a limit of function at a given point is defined when the limit from the left side and the limit from the right side both exist and they are equal so this both sided limits have to be equal so let us see how whether this property holds for this defined function or not so we are particularly interested to check this whether uh, both sided limits are equal or not because at the point where the function the limit is evaluated the function is defined differently right so for x greater than or equal to 1 it is the fx is equal to actually x and for x less than 1 fx is 1 minus x so let us quickly calculate limit for x greater than or equal to 1 this is x so this will be 1 And for when coming from the left side, this function is defined as 1 minus x. So, this will be 1 minus 1, 0. So, we can see that the left sided and right sided limits, they exist, but they are not equal. So, for this function, is not equal to x tend to 1 minus fx because 1 is 1, 1 is not equal to 0. So, we can say that the limit of the function does not exist at when x tends to 1. Okay, so let us see the given options. So, the correct option will be the limit does not exist. Okay, so does anyone have any question about this problem? I think uh, this is all right. So, the problem solving session for today's class, I guess, can be finished since no one has any more doubts. And we will be meeting every Tuesday and we will be solving this kind of problems which are given in the assignments. And you guys can find the recorded lecture and also the notes where I have solved the problems. And this uh, these links will be communicated to you from NPTEL portal. So, you guys can avail that anytime. And if you also have any doubt, you can ask me here or in the next class. I will be happy to answer any questions. Okay. So, if it is okay with all of you, 
uh, can I end this meeting? Okay. Thank you everyone for joining. I hope you will also be joining in the next class also. Okay. Bye then.